But we're Take definitely care. hanging here with some of the TSR people. We got Tim and Colin and Harold and Andrea and me and Roger, and, and we're here to talk about all the great audio CDs that we've created for the experienced gamer. How's that fit in with what you want to do, Tim? I consider my CD kind of different uh, because it's mainly music. It's, Man. a, it's a listening CD more than an interactive CD. Which CD? We're talking about Red Steel and Savage Baronies? Red Steel and Savage Baronies. Is it all cool. music? That's mostly music. Uh, we've got uh, mostly audio tracks on the Red Steel CD, but there's a couple of voice tracks too. And uh, the Savage Barony CD is all music. So you could play these uh, over and over and you could use them any, any game you wanted to. Yeah, you could. Cool. <laughs> now, if you were the dungeon master, you, would you just start playing with this? Would you play this and then start giving your dialogue, or what? Uh, it depends on uh, how I'm running the game. If, yeah. I'm, um, if I'm setting up a situation where I want to introduce them suddenly to something, I might give them a verbal introduction first and talk them into a situation and then you know, start playing this to develop the background as, it, as I get there. Okay, how many different music tracks are we talking on, on those two CDs? Um, Got a guess? Around 14 or 15 on yeah. each of them. They're new pieces by uh, Dominic Messenger, um, who I think did a great job. Um, he uh, did some really inspired work. What's this track? This is uh, Don Luis de Manzanas. Uh, oh, is, yeah. This is a track uh, that describes one of the main heroes of the Savage Coast. Sounds like Don Quixote. Uh, something like that. He's a, he's, a, he's a bold explorer, and he uh, will go and exp uh, explore different dungeons and the wildernesses as well. He's, does he smile a lot and have a lot of teeth? He does. <laughs> and the question. He's also a nobleman. Um, and he is one of the inheritors on the Savage Coast. And the inheritors are people that uh, manipulate the curse that overrides the whole area on the Savage Coast. Uh, he manipulates the curse for his own end, gaining magical powers from it. So he can be something like a superhero. Great, but again, this is a great m musical piece that you can play specifically for Red Steel or you could use in any other campaign setting as well, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. I mean, a lot of the music from Sing Red it, Steel was kind of based around uh, different movie themes. Um, Wait a minute, so I, sense, I sense a shift. This is still one of uh, mine. This is called uh, Riders of the Yazaks, which uh, tells about the goblin hordes uh, north Ooh. of the Savage Coast. This is very, theoretically a goblin song? Yeah, it's a very alien sort of piece. I asked the composer to do a lot of things with uh, different instrumentation so that it didn't sound very normal. He's got the, the the bold movement of the horde, and he's got these real alien sounds. And whenever I hear this, I always picture this hordes of goblins mounted on walls riding towards us with banners flying. And this. Sounds like he's using an anvil. Could be something like that. So, Raj, would you use something like that in your campaign? When uh, I was editor of Dragon Magazine, we had a lot of people writing in to the forum section talking, trying to recommend different types of music they would play during game sessions, what worked for this and what worked for that. Wow. We've been using this for a long time, and lately I've started to see a great deal of uh, discussion of it online. When I started playing Dungeons & Dragons in the late 1970s, people were already using music quite a bit as background noise. They would... Uh, take material from Lord of the Rings or other television or movie shows and play them on the 
record player and we'd all play along to that turned down in the background so you could do that. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. unfortunately, the CD is a lot more convenient than a, a cassette tape or a or even a record. Yeah. You can jump to the track that's appropriate for a given situation. This one, you don't have to worry about all sorts of fast forwarding, right? Now, this one that we're hearing now is um, called Selwyn's theme, which is kind of the love theme of the Savage Coast. <laughs> it's uh, for everyone. <laughs> well, and if any place needs a love theme, ones. I would think it would be the Savage Coast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a uh, it's a very savage setting, but there's also a lot of swashbucklers, a lot of romance to it. Tim, what would you say is your favorite track off of uh, Red Steel or Savage Fury? It depends on what I want. In a lot of ways, I really like uh, this one, Solomon's theme. Yeah. It's, um, it's a very sad piece that strikes a lot of chords in me. But on the other hand, uh, Don Luis de Manzanas really sums up the coast with yeah. the bold adventuring style. Uh, some of them I like because they're well played, some of them because they're well composed, some of them because they strike emotional chords. Do you see romance as being a part of the adventure? Um, sure. In the uh, in the Savage Coast and the Red Steel setting, romance, I think, is a great role-playing hook that uh, you, know, you can talk about this uh, love that's developed and uh, they might have to leave and then you go on a quest to uh, save that person or to, to win her back or whatever. It does seem to be a traditional part of fantasy story. But music's just one of the things that we can do with the CD. I know that in uh, in Planescape we've taken a little different tack. What, uh, what exactly did we do with our CD? Oh wait, just listen. I am a Mamir, a magical construct designed to provide information. I can be a most valuable aid in a successful exploration. This is a CD from a player's primer to the Outlands. What we've done with this is pretty unique because it's for the players and uh, it represents an actual artifact in the game. I perform only in the outer planes. My information comes straight from the mouths of plane walkers, proxies, or petitioners. Planescape, of course, is our uh, campaign setting that takes fantasy to the edge. What exactly does that mean, Andrea? What's so different about Planescape that somebody would want to get into that as their new AD&D universe? Well, if I'm a, if I'm a dwarf or an elf uh, or a human uh, in the Dragonlance realms or Forgotten realms, I really have not a clue to what crazy things exist beyond. And Planescape offers you the multiverse. Regular AD&D is more like Lord of the Rings. This is down and dirty in the outer planes. <laughs> <laughs> Rusty yeah. and organic both at the same time. Yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, it's a campaign that's really got a, a distinctive attitude. A player's primer to the Outlands is a product that's designed to be used by the player to figure out what's going on. So in game yeah. terms, what is the item? Is it... It's a, it's a skull. It's, 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 skull. it's a little silver, a silvery floating skull. It's something you actually use in the game. You pick it up, you carry it with you wherever you go. Uh, if you won't have a question while you're out adventuring, your character throws this into the air, you uh, hit the track that you want to play, and uh, so, it gives you the information that you need. So the Mimir is a, a magical item that answers questions for you, and, and in a sense the CD itself is the Mimir? Yeah, exactly. It's almost like a Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy thing. It's uh, not exactly totally accurate information. It's, uh, <laughs> I see. It, it's, it's really uh, more... Uh, people's impressions uh, who have adventured around recording onto this thing. Well, actually, 
we'll try to set up like a little little role playing scenario. Let's say Colin is uh, adventuring out in the uh, outlands. He's a blood. He's new to the plains. Those are the realms beyond the realms of traditional fantasy, home of the gods, the if fiends. If he's new to the plains, wouldn't he be clueless? Clueless. Really right. That's true. And not to say that Colin is usually clueless. <laughs> so let's say, let's, say, uh, let's say he's a clueless cutter. He's uh, happened into a uh, bazaar, bazaar in the outlands, and he sees a little fellow before him, and the fellow has gleaming, glittering skulls floating in the air before him and points to one of the skulls and says, Mimir, why tell my friend about uh, Sylvania? <laughs> the town of Sylvania surrounds the gate to Arborea. Unfortunately, there was no use in trying to get a description of the place for every agent sent failed to return with any usable information. Too many bodies, they said. Wow. So, <laughs> so that was a little outtake of the skull talking. And let's say Colin uh, is uh, interested in hearing more. Go ahead. Ask it a question. Tell me about Fawnel, the gate town to the Beastlands. <laughs> Track 8. Fawnel's gate leads to the Beastlands. It's, it's a, a ruined city. city. Always teetering on the brink of destruction. To tell us of Farnal is Tosta Shira, a zebra striped cat centaur from an unknown location. So what's the idea behind the multiple voice thing there? Well basically it's a, it's a magical item. It's not just a, not just one person talking. We are hoping to create the sort of effect that uh, you know it's a multitude of voices blending in together. Okay. How, how does the mirror the itself is is introducing the the track that's coming up, effectively introducing the place that's featured, and afterward an agent that has carried the mirror around, kind of eavesdropping and gathering information, will be heard. So, for example, right after the mirror is introducing uh, Faunal, you'd hear. The beauty of Faunal is that anyone partial to animals is welcome here. If you don't mind holding a conversation with an animal that's probably smarter than you are, you'll get along fine. It's said that people come here to forget their past lives, to lose themselves in the dreaming nights and glorious ruins of Faunal. In fact, that's where I met my name. So this particular set of tracks was set up to go exactly with what's in the player's primer to the Outlands, but can you get more utility out of this in a Planescape campaign after you've, you've finished what's in that particular set? The people who are recorded on here, besides the Mimir itself speaking, which is the multi-voice part, um, are often, uh, they're either somebody who's reporting directly to the Mimir or a conversation that the agent who carried the Mimir has overheard. And some of the best darks are little secrets that you might pick up out of the conversation. So you might have to listen to it a couple of times to pick something up. On the other hand, uh, you know, it's as good as any rumor. Uh, yeah. Accuracy not guaranteed, but definitely it's as good as any adventure hook. Planescape is written with a very distinctive cant that uh, is borrowed somewhat from uh, Victorian uh, street Victorian language. Slang. That's right, <laughs> and uh, once you get into the campaign setting, it pretty much becomes secondhand. That uh, a blood somebody who's uh, experienced does a lot clueless is uh, obviously and someone who hasn't <laughs> hasn't a clue. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what what's a dark? A secret. Uh, something unknown, something not obvious. So, Harold, this stuff isn't part of your group, but we do have a CD that is part of your group that's um, all based in Ravenloft. I should talk about that for a bit. Well, A Light in the Belfry is for Ravenloft. And Ravenloft is horror, kind of fantasy horror. We take classical stories of uh, madness and passion and terror and obsession, and we weave them all together to make a very challenging set of adventures for the heroes. We draw a lot of this, of course, from day-to-day -day life at TSR. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Scares me. I, I really enjoy the horror. We, uh, we're really challenging the players here. And The Light in the Belfry, what we've done with the CD is something kind of special because it's a mystery. And the pieces of the mystery are revealed through the CD one by one as you Great. piece together a puzzle. Uh, something else that we also have on the CD is we have uh, we have dramatic presentations of information. Um, you mean like box text in a lot of our adventures is, well, is read dramatically? Uh, the box text is read dr dramatically, but also the background. The historical oh, okay, background yeah. is presented dramatically. This represents something that the adventurers would actually be hearing as they're going through the adventure, Yeah, so it's it? like actually a bard it's, or a song. Right. Uh, like. <sighs> At last, 
a home to call my own. Oh, I will prove worthy of these good people here in Avonlea. I pray the gods I will. Rumors of the house's sudden construction whispered through the land of Avonlea. Before long, the tales which were spread included stories of ghosts haunting the manor house, and Morgoroth's wood came to be called the Phantasmal Forest. How rightly so. What's nice is at the very end of it, we have a, a library of sound effects that you can weave into your adventure. Like a for instance. Oh, well, let's see. To start, we'll have to have the hour right. The clock chimes midnight. Spooky, huh? Nice. I like it. <laughs> yes. Now, we, we have dramatic times. We have thunderstorms. Because it's on a CD and you can pick your tracks, mm -hmm. you can uh, put together a, a sequence. Here's here's one that I've, I I like. It's a, a mob looking for a monster. First the mob, and then we're going to come upon the forest, and then you'll hear the, their encounter with the monster. The other thing that we have is we do have a lot of drama and romance, so uh, maybe we could play some of those tracks for you. Uh, we'll just do a, a you quick have piece. romance, too? Well, um, I said passion. <laughs> <laughs> By the gods, the feelings are well up inside of me when I see her. Her grace, intelligence, beauty. I fell in love with her the moment that I saw her, trite as that might sound. But who would not? She was always unfailingly kind to me. Well, what we have here is, of course, an easy exit. So if you ever have to get out, you can do this. Terror Tracks. In a game even one can play. At night. When you're most alone. Deployment operations are handed down from Tracks Command. Or trace, research, analyze, and exterminate. You get the calls. Cue track one. Push play. You solve the mystery. Stop the horror. You make your choices. Select your tracks. Your choices may even result in the death of an agent. Access the horror. Interface the terror. Not a game for the faint of heart. <laughs> Everyone knows to dial 911 in case of emergency. Everyone knows that a 911 operator on the other end will dispatch police, fire, and medical personnel to rescue you. All of the CDs that we've talked about so far have to do with the Advanced Dungeons and Dragons campaign universes, but Terror Tracks is a little different. Good. You have successfully reached Track 3. Track 5. Begin monitoring Track's hotline. Repeat. Track 5. Begin monitoring Track's hotline. Failure to advance to Track 5 will result in suspension of Track's control. Terror Tracks, you start listening and you hear a little portion of an adventure, and then you decide what direction you want to go in. You don't need any rules for these, do you? No, you sure don't. So you can, you can direct the entire story yourself? Yeah, in fact, you're uh, directing the person that you listen to. He will call for decisions that you need to make, and then you decide what you want him to do. The following phone call was referred to us seconds ago. Please analyze and activate. 911, what is your emergency? Please, please, calm down and speak slowly and clearly. I am here to help. 